Toby, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. Always a pleasure. Is this number three? Number four? Yes. You may number be three. our number one most invited back guest. I don't know why that is. I invite myself back. Uh, the, uh, I was kind of hoping, I'm not going to lie, that you were going to show up in your scary Halloween outfit. <laughs> Will you tell the listeners what that was? Yeah, so I, I, love, uh, I love Hugh Henry. I love, Hugh, I, I love Hugh Henry back when he was uh, beating up on all of the, um, the Eurozone bureaucrats about how they fly first class and he had the, the red glasses. And I used to just say to my wife, look, this guy's, this guy's a funny guy. He's kind of uh, hilarious and I love his strategy. He's got that you know, short kind of blow up type strategy. And uh, you know, he's, he's had some time in the wilderness because it's been tough to run short biased blow up type funds through an incredibly long, probably long in the tooth bull market. And uh, I follow him on Twitter and I just, and I've, I've seen his real vision appearances as well. And I just, I just love the, the person that he's evolved into away from the pinstripe and the red glasses into that kind of trucker hat, baseball shirt, long hair, don't care kind of attitude. And so I, I, I had those pieces lying around, including some white sunglasses <laughs> that you gave me funnily enough and uh, just, kismet all came together so i threw it on and it looked exactly like he did uh, did anyone reckon i mean you you weren't like trick-or-treating with this right like i was to say did any because that would have been so great if anyone could possibly recognize and identify that that's like only on fintwit no that, that, and that was why i posted it because my kids didn't get it they, they were completely baffled by how how it was or what a hedge fund manager my son thought that was some kind of animal that like a hedgehog he went dressed as a bat uh, and that was not any commentary on, on coronavirus or anything like that. It was just because he likes bats. Yeah. Well, we had, we had Captain America. Um, all right. So, I, you know, despite the fact I feel like we would have exhausted all possible topics of conversation, your fourth, third, fifth time on. We'll link to those in the show notes, by the way, listeners. Uh, Toby, what's, uh, what's your best idea right now? So the, we've, we've recently um, taken over a fund. I've partnered with the Round Hill guys who have uh, some interesting funds. Uh, and we've, there was a competitor, uh, the old, the Deep Value Fund. Uh, we've, we've taken that over and we've changed the ticker and the strategy. So the ticker is now Deep, D-E-E-P, um, which is a theme through everything that I have done because I wrote a book, Deep Value. And that's my investment style. And um, we have transitioned the strategy from it. It was a very concentrated, um, large, deep value strategy, very similar to the strategy that I ran in, that I run in the Acquirers Fund, which the ticker is Zig there, but Zig is long short, and this was long only. So now we've transitioned it to a small and micro fund. So basically it focuses on the smallest 75% of companies listed in the US. Um, we go through those, companies and look for cash rich balance sheets solid cash flows buying back stock so management is um doing the right thing recognizing the undervaluation taking steps to sort of capitalize on that undervaluation and um the portfolio tends to be about a hundred names equal weight just for the fact that Smaller micro companies tend to be a little bit more volatile and a little bit more risky. Balance sheets aren't quite as good as mid cap and large cap. So try to have a little bit less exposure to them. You know, management teams aren't generally as seasoned or professional as they are in mid cap and above. And there's just, you know, the, the, there are other idiosyncratic risks in them because they tend to have one line of business and they're just earlier on in their often earlier on sometimes they've been around for quite a long time but they're just slightly riskier uh fund but that sort of cuts both ways that they get very undervalued because they're they're not as heavily pursued as mid cap and large cap and uh we try to capitalize on that undervaluation that's the plan so they're about one percent equal weight at initiation we look after the portfolio on an ongoing basis and i, I think it's a good time for it I was, was kind of hoping you're going to call it deepest, the deepest of all value uh, fun with, with ticker names. Um, you know, the, the, the value conversation is well known, the maligned value investor, not just domestic, but global or really anything other than U.S. large cap and particularly the techs. Give us the macro backdrop um, for context listeners. We're recording this the day after the election or probably by the time this gets published three weeks before anything has, has been resolved. <laughs> Who knows? Um, 
I think a lot of uh, uh, the value investors are at least hoping to the horizon that there may be some sort of catalyst that would transition this long period of pain into something more livable. Give us the backdrop. What's going on right now? Why is this such a good opportunity? So I've, um, you know, there's a great bit of research done by Mikhail Samanov, Two Centuries. I don't know if you've seen that one, which is he looks at 200 years of, of value uh, outperformance, underperformance. And he stitches together the FAMA French data set, which starts in 1920, with the Cowles Commission, which was 1875 to about 1920 or 25. And the Cowles Commission one is the famous one that he put the uh, Alfred Cowles put the results on punch cards. It's like an early use of punch cards. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, his, he was trying to figure out if any investors had skill. And he con- concluded after doing this analysis that no investors had skill, which is kind of an interesting conclusion but ben graham refers to this um data set in some of his writings and he says that he went back and he looked at the performance of the value stocks in there and he found that they generated about 15 percent a year of outperformance which very very material outperformance and then there's another bit of research where somebody's gone back and looked at the surviving annual reports of companies listed from 1825 to 1875 and they're not looking at book value because you know the there was, there was uh, very little in the way of financial statements published. The only analysis that they could do on a value basis is the dividend yield. And so dividend is an imperfect yield, but it's a reasonable rough proxy. If you don't have anything else, it's pretty good. You know, higher dividend yields might indicate value lowered and dividend yields make it look more expensive. So they track it from, they stitch these three data sets together to track from 1825 to the present day. And they find that there are basically three big periods of value underperformance. And they seem to congregate around these periods of technological advancement, these booms in the States. So there's one right at the very beginning of the data set in 1841. And the significance of that date is that's the invention of the telegraph. And so until that time, information had traveled around the world on sailboats and information got to you as fast as a sailboat was blown across the ocean which is not very fast. And then the subsea cable came in, they got it almost instantaneously. So that triggered a value bust relative to the tech boom. There was another one that ended in 1904. It was down 59%. Value had trailed the growthier stocks by 59% to that point. And that was at the end of the long depression. And then there was another one uh, most recently there was the, the, the 2000 bust was not as bad as this one. The 2000 bust was significant, but, didn't kind of approach this one. We're now at 60%. So this is the worst bust for value in the data. It's lagging behind the the growth year names by an incredibly wide margin. So when you, when you look at things that are sensitive to value, small and micro is particularly sensitive to the performance in value. So it's down uh, a great deal. Any back test that you run, including small and micro or value and small and micro together leads to this, decade plus of massive underperformance but it's not um it's not all bad news because when you look at the constituents of those portfolios the constituents have got cheaper and cheaper and there's a reasonable argument to be made that somewhere between 2010 and 2015 value had become so popular that it was crowded into and there were lots of guys. So my uh, friend of mine, colleague on my podcast, Jake Taylor, wrote an article in 2015 saying it's the worst value opportunity set in 25 years because that was the data that he had. Mm-hmm. And basically his argument was that the dispersion between the overvalued or the expensive and the undervalued was so tight that you really weren't being compensated for buying these slightly worse businesses, which is, you know, value is a handicapping kind of approach. You, you are getting a slightly worse business, but you're getting a much cheaper price. So you're sort of weighing those two. So he said, it's a very, it's likely that we're going to have some bad performance here. And that's exactly what happened. And you can listen to AQR's Cliff Asness says exactly the same thing. Basically the the upshot of all of that is that value was probably appropriately punished for something like five or eight years of the last decade as it got cheaper and cheaper. But now the spread has gone back to historic widths. When the spread gets very, very wide, What that typically means is that the forward returns for value tend to be better. So I think that the two best opportunities in the market right now are small and micro value and the spread between the very overvalued and the very undervalued because it's the the spread right now is driven by an 
I, a long side that's never been more expensive, but a short side that is um, cheaper than average, but it's, it's not as cheap as it was in 2000. And the other, the other thing that happened in 2000 was the, the stocks that got sold off that actually had a higher return on assets than the expensive stocks. So uh, they were actually better companies. Now they are, they're not as good, but they're still better than they're being priced in the market. So I think that there's a huge opportunity long any kind of value, but particularly in the small and micro and particularly in long short. You're, you're starting to also see um, value liquidation. You know, the, you're seeing capitulation on funds and not, and like Julian Robertson sort of size, you know, there was a couple of weeks ago, $10 billion funds shutting down that traditionally had been value investors, um, you know, not, not insignificant amount of capital and those funds shutting down, you know, continue to uh, push things in one direction to, to eventually, you know, hopefully there's a, there's a reckoning and a reversal. Um, when you say a lot of investors probably uh, would scratch their head when you talk about large, medium, small, it means different things, to different people. What's sort of the range you're looking at uh, when you say small, micro, large, medium that, that you're sort of targeting for this fund and uh, as well as uh, Zig? So Zig is the largest 25% and it ends up being about mid cap. So $2 billion plus and above. So there's no upper cap on, on Zig, but just by virtue of the fact that if something is undervalued relative to its earnings, it tends to be a lower market capitalization. So it tends to cluster around the $8 billion average market capitalization range, which I think is a good place to be because for Zig in particular, they're professional activists, they're professional investors, uh, professional private equity investors who hunt in that sort of range because that's, that's a place they can put enough capital to work, they can take that private. And so there's professional management, they're well resourced. It's a good safe place to hunt for names. Below that level, uh, in the small and micro, so micro might be below about 300 million. The fund itself has a, has a floor of $75 million in market cap, and that's driven by NYSE listing standards. And then it's up to about $2 billion. And all of those things are moving around all the time, but that's roughly the cutoff. Um, as I was saying before, they tend to be, you know, they can be one product companies. They may be run by the entrepreneur founder who may not have a background in finance, their background might be inventing, you know, might be engineering, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's a, that for, that's a focus on, on product and the business rather than a focus on the stock price and valuation. And the reason that that's significant, so in a previous life, I was, I was a lawyer and then I was a, an activist for a while. And it was striking the number of times that we would go into a small company that was run by a founder engineer and just say, you know, you're incredibly undervalued and, you look like you're over the next three or four years, you're going to be materially bigger and you've got this opportunity right now. You've got some spare cash. Why don't you do a buyback? And I would just say, I've never, no one's ever said that <laughs> to us before. Never thought in those terms because they don't think about that. It's just, you know, you're so close to the business. It's yeah. hard to think about the valuation. Well, it's like you guys have talked about this a lot on your podcast. Um, but the, this concept, you know, the book, the outsiders and others like the, the CEO, job the sexy part what many founders are is you know they're product developers they're scientists they're engineers they built the company maybe sales or whatnot and then you have arguably equally if not more important is the capital allocation particularly when you get to be public and you can move a lot of these different levers um you know for for value creation in many cases that's equally if not more important it's just kind of boring it's like talking about like fees and taxes uh to to, to investors um, so, all right, we have the macro backdrop, you know, there seems to be some coincident indicate, you never know how bad this is going to get, you know, it, it's, it's painful to watch all my value friends on fin Twitter elsewhere. Just like, it's like body blow after body blow after body <laughs> blow. Um, it just continues. Do you have any predictions, any forecasts on what might be the like final catalyst? Is it the SPAC boom? Is it just weight of, you know, things getting too crazy? What? Any general thoughts? I don't know who some, I forget who has the great line about, you know, predicting 11 of the last two recessions or something like that. But I feel like I've, I've predicted 
20 of the last zero value turnaround. So um, value does seem to catch these little wavelets every now and again. So there was one last year, you know, there was that, there was that huge day, September 9th, where there was the, it was the biggest day for value since like 2000. It was the worst day for momentum since 2001 or something like that. It was like a six Sigma event. I know it's not normally distributed, so it's not actually a six Sigma event, but the idea is that it was an unusual event and then it was followed up the next day by the same thing. Then value had this great run from mid September to sort of mid December. And that was glorious just for that short period of time to not be sailing into the, the headwind like we always are. I think, it's hard to say because I, I just think I've you know all of the things that the magazine covers are universally hating on value value guys shutting up shop. Uh, all of that stuff seems to me to be you know the, the anecdotal backdrop is there, but nothing's ever manifest. But the the way that I think about it, so ultimately I'm a value guy more than I'm anything else, and so I, I you know what return do you get when you buy? A company the, the return that you should expect to get is basically the dividend yield plus whatever growth you can extract from that company and i would have said that when i wrote deep value came out in 2014 i would have said then that you can just about bank on mean reversion in the stock price too that that third element would deliver the return to you now i would say that having suffered you know through six years of going the opposite direction that Turns out you can't bank on mean reversion, but you still can rely on the other two. You do get the dividend yield. Dividends are real once they're paid into the account and the underlying growth should be real as well. You know, you've had this growth where the, where the, the multiple has worked against us the whole way through that. And I've, there's some great research from O'Shaughnessy that pointed out that what traditionally happens with value stocks is the market just overestimates how bad the situation is. So, you buy them and you see the decline in the earnings over the holding period, but it's more than made up for the fact that because the market has overestimated how bad it's going to be, you see this multiple expansion and that's where the return comes from. And the converse is true for the expensive stocks that typically what they see is the market expects huge earnings growth. They see earnings growth, but they get multiple compression because the earnings growth inevitably disappoints. What we've seen over the last decade is the reverse the earnings growth has been accompanied by multiple expansion and the earnings declines in the value stocks has been accompanied by multiple compression. So it, the mean reversion has been working in the other way. But when I look at the portfolios now, when I look at Zig or I look at Deep, I can see the yield versus the index and the category average and the yield is materially higher than either of those two. And the growth rates, whether you're looking historically, whether you're looking at earnings or sales or cash flow or book value, the growth rates are all higher. So at some stage, that does shine through. And then probably right at the time that we, we don't need it because we're already getting the return from the yield and the, and the underlying growth, you start seeing the mean reversion in the, in the pricing as well. So probably they both come together. So to me, that's the best catalyst. To be fair, that's been around for a little while. So I think value has been unfairly punished for the last couple of years, but it's now, I think that the, the Delta is getting so big that it's very hard to ignore if you're, if you're an allocator and you're looking at, you know, do you expect these enormous companies to continue to expand at the rates they have, or are there better opportunities elsewhere that are lower risk and probably likely more certain return? Listeners, you don't have to believe uh, Toby about this. You can go type uh, any, ticker symbol in the morning star and they often will give you not often they will give you a uh, composite snapshot of the underlying fund holding characteristics and it'll tell you um, price to earnings dividend yield all these metrics you hit the uh, portfolio tab and we've been talking about this to investors for a long time because it's falling under this category of like know what you own there's some funds that say they are like a certain style or an idea and you type in their characteristics and it spits out numbers to where you say, Oh dear God, like this is what I'm investing in. This is uh, totally insane. And um, I love Vanguard, but some of their funds are simply just so big, $50 billion. I'm looking at one in particular and it's composite metrics for what would be considered to be a dividend fund is just, it makes me nauseous. Like I, it seems like the, the riskiest thing on the planet. So anyway, don't believe Toby, even though he's correct, uh, type it in, go do the work yourself and you'll find um, some astonishing characteristics. How much of this 
you know, for a long time, the, the U.S. market seemed to me to be um, look pretty similar as far as far as large cap, mid cap, small cap. And then 2020 came around and just kind of like blew a, a enormous gaping torpedo hole in the hole of particularly small value. Um, you know, many uh, you now seem to have a huge dispersion there within the U.S. as well um, on, on the small and micro. Is that something you see? Is that accurate, inaccurate? No, I agree 100%. I, I love the, you know, it's, if you're investing on fundamentals alone, it's been probably one of the worst two years. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't investing in the late 1990s, but the experience is equivalent to those. There's some great research. So Cliff Asness's colleagues uh, have released a paper on value where you can go through and you can, they, they sort of tried to deal with all of the narratives about why value is sort of irrevocably broken or irretrievably broken. And I've sort of pretty successfully, in my opinion, I'm biased, but they've sort of dispatched with all of those arguments. But the best little part of it, in my opinion, is this part where they say, let's create this um, test where we're going to explicitly cheat. So they, they, they are cheating. And the idea is that you get next year's Ford earnings this year. So you're going to be investing on information that the system doesn't have. If you can invest that way, you naturally you get a really good sharp ratio, you get a really good Sortino ratio, you massively outperform because you, you get the information that you don't otherwise have. But they set it up explicitly to cheat, to test the idea how closely the price follows the, the fundamentals of the business. And so they find that as you'd expect, most of the time you massively outperform. There are two periods where uh, you, you, the coefficient is around the wrong way and you really underperform. And those two periods are 99, 2000 and 2019 and 2020. So as a fundamental guy, it's been a very, very tough year where they're, they're already looking pretty interesting and cheap, I thought, in February. And then, like you say, the torpedo came in and just has blown these things so far away from the underlying intrinsic values. I think the part of the reason is, you know, it's obvious that the, the shutdown of the coronavirus has impacted everything uh, in a different way. The, the tech companies clearly, you know, we're recording this on Zoom. We're both working from, you're in the office, but I'm working from home. It's easy enough to communicate this way. So there's lots of companies that really aren't impacted. The smaller stuff uh, the stuff that requires some manufacturing or requires you to sell in a store or whatever the case may be, clearly that's impacted more. And because they're already sort of under-resourced, well, not under-resourced, they just have less in the way of kind of ballast. It impacts them more. But when I, whenever there's a, you know, it's not, it's not a Morningstar analysis, but there are other analyses that you can do to look at the fund. So what's the factor exposure of Zig and Deep? The factor exposure is they tend to be the most concentrated into value of the funds that, that are examined. You can, you, you, I think Eric Balchunas has some, done some work on that. He's the Bloomberg ETF anchor. You can see in his Twitter feed, he talks about it a little bit. So it's clear that we have a very big value exposure, but it's what we also have is a very big quality exposure. I'm not a quality investor necessarily, but I think it's very hard to separate out value from quality in the sense that it's hard to have the value there if you don't have the quality and the quality is kind of a, a little bit of a movable feast, but basically we'd all agree that it's cash rich balance sheets over debted, indebted balance sheets, cash flows as a, as opposed to sort of cash burn and so on, those kind of ideas. And so we're value guys, but we're not trying to just fire and shoot, you know, the, the cheapest thing in the market on a price to book value basis, because it's not going to work very well. What we're trying to find is, things that are very, very inexpensive relative to their flows that also possess the characteristics of healthy balance sheets and so on that would allow them to survive through periods like this. So we can take advantage of that massive undervaluation. Ultimately, it's a good thing because it should lead to better performance down the road, even though it's incredibly painful to endure it in the period where the prices get pushed away the way that they have. I, I almost wonder, you know, you've also seen even, um, and feel free to weigh in on this, I, I don't really have an opinion. Uh, you know, a lot of the value crowd have, um, you know, kind of abandoned price to book. I mean, dimensional, this has been their baby for decades. They got massive. They've seen a bunch of outflows, actually, I think this year, partially due to, to other reasons. But um, a lot of the value crowd 
has, has kind of fallen on two sides on things like price to book. Um, I, and I just, I smile to myself sometimes because I wonder if this is like, it just, again, like reaching an extreme where all of a sudden, even the value guys hate price to book. And then all of a sudden there's going to be like a 10 year, just monster run for price to book when everyone's like, okay, wait, that doesn't work anymore. And then it just absolutely takes off. The theoretical basis for price to book is pretty sound. The reason that uh, historically quants and, you know, guys like Walter Schloss and so on. And Schloss had a record of 20% a year for like 50 years, something like that. He's probably, uh, you know, not, not necessarily quantitative in his approach, but probably maybe quantitative in his outcome in the sense that he had quite a few holdings, roughly equal weight. And he was just looking for cheap on a book value basis, but you know, other characteristics that might've allowed it to survive for a little bit longer. But the, the argument for price to book value, I find to be pretty sound in the sense that the flows are variable and volatile and move up and down. So cash flows and earnings and so on move around, whereas book value should be pretty static. The difficulty is that book value for a tech company is going to be very different for book value for a, a miner or for a bank or for, so the, clearly there are different types of businesses out there, but I agree 100%. Like I think it's to the point where book value has been so thoroughly buried and it, the, the, uh, you know, you can read the obituary in, in any number of papers from any, nobody wants to be associated with it. And it's kind of like a laughing stock. You know, I'm like, I'm a contrarian as much as I'm a value guy. I kind of feel like that's the, that's how you set up a scenario where you just go on a 10 year tear for book value. And it's the crazy thing about this business is how closely narrative follows price rather than the other way around. You sort of expect price to follow the narrative, but it's never that way. All of the, all of the, uh, the obituaries are written after the underperformance and not prospectively. And so I'd be, you know, the, the, then weighing against that is also Cliff Asness has also in his, in his sort of writings has said uh, that the, the underperformance of book value has sort of slightly ended through this period because it's done a little bit better than all of the other value metrics because it's not such a good value metric. You know, it, it hasn't done what value has done, which like the, the, the best expression of value has massively underperformed through here. You know, that's how you know that you're running a good value fund because you haven't done as well as everything else. If you're doing really well through this period, there's a chance that what you're expressing isn't value. You might be expressing something else. I know that a lot of discretionary guys who've, you know, value guys in particular have, um, who are discretionary, I think that they are, potentially they migrate from strategy to strategy. So, you know, book value doesn't work. So we migrate a little bit to, cash flows and then we include some growth and we start including some other quality factors in there explicitly or implicitly so explicitly if you're a quant you know what's in your you kind of know what you're constructing if you're if you're discretionary you may not know you might just be accidentally expressing a preference for growth or for something else and then uh the market might change because that's what the markets tend to do and if that happens then all of a sudden um, you're tied to some factor that is underperforming and you, in, you thought you were a value guy and all of a sudden it turns out your growth and, you know, momentum or something like that, which I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's, if there are a few ships marooned when this turns around and it turns out that the tide was, uh, was, you know, they were sort of flowing along with the wrong tide. We, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that about momentum. I was Rebalancing, rebalancing some of our portfolios and we, we own both um, on the value and momentum side and in, in our allocation funds. And I actually thought it was a mistake when we looked at the momentum allocation, I said, this can't be right. How do we own so much of this fund? And it's this, ma I mean, this year alone, there is a 50 percentage point spread. I think it's up 35 for like a momentum, uh, ballpark fund and about down 15 for like a pure concentrated you could use west funds or anyone else who has kind of the two coins momentum um and and value that also has to be at like historic spreads i mean this run that momentum's had versus uh value and momentum being an even more like on steroids version of just market cap weighting is is that sound about right <laughs> 
Yeah, I, um, I don't track momentum that closely, but I, I, I think that momentum is interesting from the perspective of it might be the best way to be a growth investor because the momentum in the stock price matches pretty closely over time the momentum in the fundamentals of the business in the sense that they, the, the fastest growers tend to be, uh, have the fastest growing share price. The problem you know, for, for fundamental guys is that often that turns around. It just invites competition. But momentum is, a, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against momentum, incredibly robust strategy. It's just that I think that the, exp- like, like, I guess like the expression of value, there are many different versions of momentum and there are as, probably as many momentum funds as there are uh, value funds. And there are as many, as many kind of secret sources as there are for value funds as well. So I think there's a very wide dispersion. There are some that have done exceptionally well and there are some that have struggled a little bit. Well, my, my favorite is when value and momentum intersect. And right. the problem with this last couple of years is value has been such a plague that even when you do value and momentum, the value has been so bad that it just, you know, it infects the momentum and the value and momentum has been as bad, if not worse. And, and you guys, uh, we have one strategy that's been absolutely atrocious the last few years. And anytime I get too depressed about it, because it does that intersection, there's a Vanguard fund. A lot of people don't know this, but Vanguard has a lot of not market cap index funds. Uh, they have a, a market neutral fund, for example, um, and it's as bad, if not worse, and along the same lines of, of, uh, of course, AQR as well. Um, but just going to show that depending on how you do it, because some people will like buy half value stocks, half momentum stocks and mix them. Other people will average the ratings. And so within the sort of practitioner art of uh, putting a portfolio together, it, depending on how you do it, uh, the value. It's such a compelling argument. The whole right. ship. Yeah. It's, it's such a compelling argument because you say, well, we're going to buy something that's undervalued plus it has positive momentum. So well, you know, and under one of those constructions, rather than you just mixing the, two, mixing the two extremes, finding the ones where they intersect, that's a pretty strong argument. We've got this thing that is cheap, plus people are buying it, so it's going up. So other people have identified what's in it. How can that not work? Yeah. Uh, it just turns out if, if you've got any exposure to value, that, that's, what, that's what kills you. We're just going to martingale in and just every 10% of, of spread. It's I think you'd be out of money. You're out of bullets. That was, that, was my can, that was my cannabis strategy. I said, every, every 50% cannabis goes down. I'm going to double, <laughs> double my bet. It's going to keep getting closer to the wall, 50% each way. And then soon I'm going to end up with a massive position. Um, so w- one of the cool things, you know, I, I used to talk a lot about 13F tracking uh, back in the day and wrote a book on the topic, listeners. There's a free download on the website, uh, which is where you can track hedge funds through their holdings. And, and you know, being a quant, I'm a little more distant to holdings, but I, I still love to dig around. And so I was looking at, at Toby's funds and, you know, the, the acquirers fund that we mentioned earlier, uh, it's a lot more recognizable, a lot of the names they hold because uh, it's larger cap. But my favorite when I wrote this 13F book is I said, there's no point to me in tracking managers like that all end up owning the same hedge fund hotel names. My favorite people to follow, like Seth Parman at Valpost and others, uh, I would love to, when I look at their portfolio and look at their names and say, I've literally never heard of any of these companies. And so when I was reviewing uh, the deep holdings, I, uh, I, it was uh, endearing to see that of the top 20, I think I can literally name one, maybe two, hold on. Uh, Anyway, I figured I'd give this an opportunity for you to chat a little bit about uh, the framework philosophy or case study on a few of the ideas uh, and how they're kind of representative of, of uh, what gets into this uh, strategy. Well, let's talk a little bit about the strategy. So I, was, uh, I used to be a lawyer, I was a mergers and acquisitions lawyer in Australia initially and then in San Francisco doing tech m and and then I went back and I was general counsel of a public company for a period of time and then worked as an activist in a fund with a specialization in undervalued asset situations where there was some complexity. So folks who've been in the market for a little while might remember that Macquarie Bank used to, and they may still do this, but what they like to do was these reasonably complex structures where they'd take an asset like uh, a port or a rail or something like that. And they'd put that into a trust, which was flow through for tax purposes. And then they would staple to the trust security, 
a unit in the or a share in the manager so you had this was what, what was called a stapled security they did quite well with that and then there were a lot of imitators in australia as well and in the 2007-2009 bust uh, anything that is sort of complicated becomes toxic and so these things traded down way below what they were worth and what we were doing was buying these things and trying to unpick the complicated corporate structure so i I'm in some ways attracted to things that have a slightly more complicated corporate structure that disguises the underlying value. So one example of that in the States is Big Larry Holdings, run by a gentleman by the name of Sardar Big Larry. It's in the fund, uh, the tick is BH. It's probably, it's reasonably well known because he's, he's a colorful character. He ran a thing called the Lion Fund uh, for about two decades, continues to run it. Now it's owned by Big Larry Holdings, and this is, we're gonna get into the complexity here. He's, he's managed to outperform for two decades, despite the fact that the last few years have been quite rough for, for everybody, including him, who's got a value bent. But basically what, this fu- what the company is, and he's got two shares on issue, A and B, he controls both. He controls the company. He sold into the company his, his fund, and the fund has the old Buffett partnership, 0625. So he's now compensated as the manager of a public company with a Buffett partnership type compensation structure where he gets paid a carry based on a high watermark and and performance over 6% a year. The company itself was originally, he's bought things like Western Sizzlin, Steak and Shake, (laughs) Maxim, and so, and they've got like a, they've got a cafe somewhere where he likes to go. There are a lot of reasons why this thing is cheap, but basically it's now trading at a massive discount to its cash and marketable security. So that's the, that's why it's deep value because it's traded down like that. Everything so, in deep so value. Just, just, to, just to interrupt real quick, just because I was laughing, is that when you originally said this, I thought you were saying Big Larry, B A G L A R R Y, almost like. Um, you know, that was yeah, his Larry. last name, but I, I, I thought it was like a, I was reminding me of an old quant factor uh, name that was popular in screens over a decade ago, which was the big dog, those like shirts. Do you remember those? Yeah. You, yeah. Any listeners? Um, it was the most preposterous uh, company. And I used to be so angry that it was in our models. I'm like, I can't possibly own this. This is the most, anyway, it, it just reminded me of that. But do you know why? The number one reason this company uh, has massive upside is if you go to their website, it looks like it was it, like in the same thing with Berkshire. It looks like it was made in 1987 pre-internet. It, it literally, the font is like stretched and look, it is all black and white. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's so bad. Well, that's, that's the gag. The guy, the guy is <laughs> so a mass, the guy's a massive fan of Buffett's. And that's why the ticker is BH because it's, it's Berkshire Hathaway. That's funny. And then he's a deep value guy and he's got the A shares and the B shares and he's got the Buffett partnership for compensation structure. He's also incredibly dismissive of shareholders. So the, the, all of the uh, transactions are lawful. There's no question about insider dealing or anything like that, but they are still, um, they still make investors in the company angry. And he's, when they go to the general meetings and they ask him questions, he's sort of dismissive. He says, you're either along for the ride and if you don't like it, you can just sell your shares. And he is the one who buys them in the market and the company buys back stock too. So that's all of the, that's all of the reasons why this thing's really cheap. And also because of the accounting rules, when they, because a lot of their holdings, are, you know, it's an investment business now. A lot of the, uh, the losses in the investment portfolio run through the, uh, the income statement plus they've got some debt that needs to be rolled there's a lot of issues with this thing but it is also trading at a massive discount to its cash and marketable securities and then you've got a guy in there who is actually a really good investor i mean he's he's not particularly shareholder friendly in both senses of the word in the way that he sort of runs the company and also in the way that he communicates with shareholders but He's heavily incentivized to make this thing work because of his incentive structure. And also it's his name on the door now. And if you're going to be a Buffett acolyte, you've got to deliver some returns. So I think that the companies that he's in, their restaurants, they're going to get really beaten up through a period like this. It doesn't take much for this company to turn around materially and start outperforming. And then all of those investments are going to start running back through the 
income statement. And this thing will be a much different beast with a little tailwind to value. So it, I, I have a lot of positions like that, that they're complex. They've got a lot of value exposure in them. And if they get a little bit of a tailwind, then it's magnified through the entire portfolio. I have a few others I can discuss too, if you want. To yeah, let's, let's do a few more while I got you. I, I, I'm getting stuck on a rabbit hole of his website, which I may spend the rest of the evening. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I say the same thing about blogs. There's like a couple blogs that go back super far. Like I think Damo Darren's is still like on blogger and it's just, I love it. So I'm like, please don't ever change. Like the most famous financial professor probably in the world. And I well, name another one. <laughs> would you yours as bad? No, I mean, no, oh, I mean, name another name finance a, professor? financial professor. Oh, come on. You can name, I can name a thousand. I do the academic world. Uh, but even I, got at NYU, I got some, even at NYU, um, you know, the, what's the, the LSV quant shop out of Chicago, mm -hmm. French Fama, all those guys. Um, a lot of them actually run money management companies. He's more corporate finance, but he, but he's, he's been on the investing train for a while. Um, yeah, he's, he's very dismissive of more traditional value guys. He's not, yeah. he's not a fan of traditional value. He's, he, he's an advocate for evolving, which I think, you know, that I understand why that folks want to make that argument, but I also think you want to be making arguments with, uh, the opportunity to see what something looks like through a full cycle. You never want to be in the trough or at the peak declaring something dead or alive because, you know, this is a nasty business where there's always some humility coming right on the train behind you. Um, all right. Let, let's hear some more uh, before so it, I uh, go down the big Larry. Uh, let's rabbit. talk about another name. So diamond Hill, the ticker is D H I L. This is a business that you will understand really well. Cause this is just the asset uh, manager. That's the one it's no, an asset manager. Guys. They got $20 billion in assets. Um, they've just declared a huge special dividend. So I, I don't know what the record date is, but I don't know when this is going to come out either. So you just probably it's too late for that, but we did catch that special dividend in the fund. The, um, you know, it's a, it's an asset manager. It's got massive returns on equity. It's way, way too cheap. The problem that they have is that they've got a whole lot of value exposure and $20 billion in assets. So if they start getting some performance, they're likely to see flows. It remains an incredibly good business. Just at the other end of the spectrum, this is a very simple to understand business that uh, is run very well. They're executing little buybacks, special dividends, all that sort of stuff that you want to see getting rid of the excess capital, which they're still producing, still cash flow positive um, through the cycle, managed really well. Uh, I, I'm, I, there's really not much more to say about it other than it's, it's a simple company to understand. It's a simple business to understand. They seem to be doing all of the right things. And I think you're catching, this is another pretty good example of what I look for, which is something that is at the bottom of its business cycle or is in a cyclical trough, but is also at a massive discount to what it's probably worth over the full cycle. And so if you see this thing cycle up out the other side, you're going to get both the performance in the business as the business sort of improves. And you're also going to get some uh, elimination of that discount in the, in the share price discount to the value. And so there's two sort of huge ways to win and you paid to hold these things because the dividend's so fat, they're still throwing off cash. They're great businesses. And that, that's sort of, that's, that's kind of the thing that I look for in both. So that's what Zig is going to hold that kind of stuff. Deep is going to hold that kind of stuff, cash flowing, strong cash balance sheets and buying back stock and paying out the dividends should work over time. How's it worked so far? You know, the, um, the diamond hill is interesting because you can look at some of these stocks, these asset managers, and they go through cycles very much depending on, um, their style being in or out of favor. You know, you have that right now where you see some of these, uh, growth managers, tech, uh, you know, disruption focus asset managers that just see assets going through the roof and vice versa, you know, and these things, I was looking at the diamond Hill chart. I mean, it's at levels and market cap back to like pre financial crisis. Um, but you can see these every few years, kind of like people uh, flowing. And, and it goes back to this concept we were talking about in our old tail risk white paper about people hedging part of their business and thinking about, you know, their risks as an asset manager of trying to sustain these periods of, of your, um, which can last a really long time. I mean, Wisdom Tree is another one. They're getting into like, I think LBO territory where 
uh, you know, they're trading at like, I think two times sales and um, pretty, pretty low relative to their assets. Uh, but for probably some of the similar, similar reasons. Um, D Diamond Hill was also, they were famous back in the day for having a lot of long short strategy too, right? The, the way that I know Diamond Hill is they have a value index. Okay. So they have, a, they have a very broad value index. It could even be 500 stocks. It's sort of like an, a replacement for the S and P 500 that's value weighted. And I, I, that was how I first heard about them. I was, I was looking at other implementations of value and I found theirs and I thought it was kind of an interesting, uh, it was an interesting expression. And then I, I didn't, I didn't see them for years until they popped into my screening and very undervalued. And I, I mean, yeah, they got, they got a, a $2 billion long short fund. That's four star fund. And I remember following this for many years back, back in the day. Uh, I, I haven't followed them in a long time, but, um, very successful uh, fund manager. I have no idea what the flows would look like, but very, 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 uh, you know, profitable, well run. Doesn't it hasn't been cash flow negative through the whole downswing. So it's a, it's a good, um, it's a, it's a very robust business. It's the kind of business that can survive. Yeah. Well, when, when, when you start to get to that scale, I mean, the, the margins on the asset management business uh, are, are some of the best in the world. If you can, if you can sustain them, um, Okay, that's a good one. You name one I knew. Any more while while I have you? Um, you know, in you know the, we could do this all night. By the way, <laughs> I'm probably going to run out of ideas. But yeah. in the in the large cap fund, so I I I hold Intel. Um, Intel's one of those. To me, it's sort of a it's a it's a crazy story because the competitors to Intel, AMD and Nvidia, have stock charts that look like ski jumps. You, you sort of um, massive uh, price to sales multiples that are only expanding combined with pretty good growth. But then Intel has this terrible looking chart, but the business underlying hasn't really taken much of a step backwards and it's forecast to continue to grow. And then on top of that, you've got a really great balance sheet. They are doing a little buyback. The risk is that there's this new generation of chips. They can't produce the chips they spend more money than the rest of the industry on R and D. I think that they probably solve that problem at some stage, but once again, you sort of paid to wait, you got the dividend and the buyback and the growth. So I think that, that, you know, sort of the, the, the portfolio should follow the dividend and the growth, even without the multiple re-rating, but at some stage, these multiples sort of, I think they have to re-rate. We, we are a, uh, a whole Intel holder as well. Um, but it's funny, you know, this also brings up a, another interesting topic. If you look at many of these, and, and Rob Arnott was talking about this recently on the podcast listeners, if you haven't listened to it, you know, some of these high flyers from the 90s, Cisco, Intel, on and on, are just now, despite being great businesses, and if you look at their business metrics for the past 20 years, Business metrics, you know, often grew every year. Business is vastly bigger. But because the stocks got so expensive in the 90s, they are just now getting back to where they were. Intel is still not back to where it was in 2000. I'm, I'm trying to look at a chart. In terms uh, of the price. In terms of the price, correct. In terms of the price. I, uh, I, I found it striking. In about 2015, it was amazing the number of companies that you could go through. And, and Microsoft was one of these companies that was sort of pitched between sort of 2010 and 2015 as being, you know, they'd had, they might've been on like 11 times PE, you know, and massively cash flow generative, good, good, strong balance sheet. They took a step back in terms of revenue in one of those years. But at that time they were transitioning to, to this sort of subscription based SaaS model. Um, and that has sort of turned them from, something that had just been dead money for 10 or 15 years from the 2000s. It's striking the number of times that I come across something like that. Walmart was another one in 2015, just hadn't gone anywhere for a decade and people get tired. But if you're tired of holding them because they don't move, but then you look at the look underneath the hood and they remain very good businesses. But I think the message here is not so much to look out for these things that have been dead money for 15 years, but to be very careful of things that, yeah, it's a really good business. I understand it's a very good business. It's growing, it's throwing off cash while it's doing that, but you've got to be careful because the price gets so far ahead of the business that they can spend a decade bumping sideways and you get all of this volatility through that period. You catch every, you catch every bust, 
you miss out on every single boom and you find 10 or 15 years later that you where you were at the beginning of the millennium and i think that this this market right now is going to be filled with stocks like that that yeah they're really really great businesses there's no disputing that but they are also at nosebleed levels of that they're so expensive that it's going to take the business 10 years to catch up to the stock price i think these spacs are going to be a graveyard um I, I just pulled up Cisco, another poster child from the 90s, as right. a good example to where it's still down 50% from the peak. Um, and it was trading at price to sales ratios, which, by the way, for today's companies seem totally, uh, totally reasonable, <laughs> totally reasonable compared to like Zoom and things. Cisco was at its peak, hit a price to sales of about 30 ish, 20 to 40, somewhere in that range, but at the, the very, very peak, probably 40. It's now at a price sales ratio of three, um, but but it just goes to show twenty years, and it's still not back to where uh, it was. And, and well, funnily enough, Cisco's one that I've picked up in Zig. That's one that we've recently added, along with another name, eBay, which was sort of oh, a dot com one point stock. eBay. It's- the thing about eBay, Toby, its user interface is so bad. It's like <laughs> I understand why some of these companies, like Carvana are totally disrupting because like I was trying to sell a car on Craigslist and it was like half scammers, half like people trying to like get your contact information for another service. eBay was just as bad. I spent like an hour responding to emails about selling and I'm like this, whatever I was selling was like $50. I'm like, this is so stupid anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but a perfect example of separating the business from the stock price. <laughs> right. And those problems are, those problems are fixable. They're not, they're not yeah. uh, permanently baked into the stock and they've got the resources to do it. They've got the cash flow and the, and the balance sheet to do it, whether they have the will or not, that's another matter. But eventually they get to the point where, uh, and, you know, eBay's, eBay's struggled a little bit, but it's still a very good business. It's still high returns on invested capital, throwing off lots of free cash flow. This is also part of the reason that, you know, having a quant screen or framework is, is helpful. Back to the, this old example I know you've talked about where Joel Greenblatt was talking about his old formula service where he would screen uh, for stocks, but then people could select. And anytime they introduced their discretion and started selecting the names out, they always picked out the best performers and got, got, got uh, put, added the ones that didn't do well. Just like my big dogs example, you know, it's like you, you start to overlay your, uh, wonky um, opinions like me hating eBay and it's probably a great idea. We're not, we're not pure quant. We have um, a forensic accounting analysis of it that, that uh, because in many instances there are things that just, they're just not captured in the, the financial statements. You need to hunt through the notes to find them. And when you're concentrated in particular, it's important to have uh, the economic reality reflect what the screens show. It's very rare that we exercise any uh, sort of forensic accounting discretion to remove anything, but it's also um, it's worth noting that we do it. So we're trying to avoid things that that have some gigantic convertible, particularly in the small and micro, that have some weird convertible note because they did it uh, some silly deal with a hedge fund to sort of in a moment of weakness needing some liquidity, and there's now this convertible note that completely changes the economics of what what you're owning. So that is particularly in the small and micro cap world. That's, that's important. So you're not just a value masochist on the long side. You also short, which just makes things twice as bad, uh, potential pain. What, what's the short, um, landscape look like? Is it, uh, just a land of opportunity? Have you gotten, uh, just a bunch of scars all across your back? What's the, uh, what, what's that world look like today? Shorting is diabolically difficult because there's so many constraints on shorting and the, where previously, if you were short, you got some rebate and some interest on the cash that no longer exists. Now it's, it's really only the performance of the securities that you short and you can't be short stuff that's heavily shorted because then you're subject to um, the whims of other investors selling in and selling out. You don't want to get squeezed as Tesla demonstrated over the last 12 months, really easy to be caught in a really ugly squeeze with Tesla. I've, the, the function of the shorts is to provide some protection for the longs in the event that the market falls over. And so I could achieve that by shorting an index, but there's some inefficiencies being long and short the same names because you also have a little bit of exposure to the, to the long names in your book, you know, very little exposure. But I also think that you can go through an index and 
you can pick out the things that are clearly much worse than everything else that are in there. And the, what, the way that we're shorting, we don't short on valuation. That is sort of a consideration, but for some of these things, it's just impossible to value them because what we're looking at is something that has statistical indications of fraud, statistical indications of earnings manipulation. They're in some sort of financial distress because they're negative cash flow and they have an enormous debt pile there. And if companies get themselves into that situation, it creates this catalyst where they have to go to the market at some stage and they either have to borrow more money or they have to sell some shares. And typically when they do that, what, what you find is that they have to take a big haircut to do that, which is sort of, that's how we get some of the performance from the short. So what, that's sort of what we're looking for. In addition to that, all of their metrics are, they indicate that they are massively overvalued. What tends to happen is that they tend to be some of the faster growing stocks. So there's a risk that um, we're short something and, the, and it does continue to deliver and that if it does a little bit better, the market does reward it. But uh, the way that we get around that is we're looking for stuff that has already started to sort of fall over. We're not shorting stuff that has an enormous amount of strength in it. We're shorting stuff that the market is already starting to abandon and sell off. And that, I think that is, it's precipitating an event in the near term where they have to do something. We have done okay on the short side. It's, in, it's, it's, it's probably generated a little bit more return than I expected it to through what has been a pretty rough market. But the, the times when it's really stood up is in March when the market fell over and a lot of value funds were down about 50% through that period of time. We were down roughly in line with the market, even though the longs were sort of beaten up as much as, the, as much as every other value fund, but the shorts did so well. They sort of stand up much more than the longs go down and they do provide that protection. And I think that that was kind of a truncated, as violent as that was and as, as, as far down as that was, I still think that, that was sort of a truncated it's not, that was not a 2007, 8, 9 bust. That was not a 99, 2000 bust. That was not a mega bust. That was sort of something that we've seen. That was a 2015 tail end bust. That was a 2018 bust. That was something that we've, that was sort of the, the smaller scale that we've seen. I think at some stage we do get, inevitably we get another mega bust. And I think that that's really when the metal of the shorts has shown in the mega bus, because some of these names, you can go back and look at what happened to high flyers in 2000, the high flyers in 2007, eight, nine, some of those companies were down 80 or 90%. And if you're short those things and you catch the very big part of that, you, you're getting paid on enough on that side of the book to sort of bail out the longs. And then it creates um, more money that you can redeploy long because we're rebalancing all the way through that. And that creates this very interesting return profile for long short funds if they're executed properly. We're sort of new, we, we have to demonstrate that we can execute it properly, but that's the, I think that it will be, uh, I think that the return profile, profile will be interesting because we're 100% long net when the market's going up and we're, we're gonna be um, getting a little bit more payoff from the shorts when the market goes down. So I, I'm, I'm sort of eager to show what it looks like through a, through a real bust. Well, we'll have you back on in 2025, 2030, 2040, whenever that may happen. Um, you know, it's funny, like short sellers are always my favorite people. Uh, they're, they're a little bit wonky. Like I feel like their brains all work differently. You have the, the struggle of, of having to keep both, both sides in your head. It's like well, value sure and short value short, but like the long side. And you know, it's like not, so, not sure what to cheer for, but, you know, I think you hit on it. And if you talk to most hedge fund, or fund managers, I think most will say the same thing you would say, which is, um, you know, that they really deliver when, uh, when, it's hit, <clears throat> when it's hitting the fan. And that can often happen so fast that it's, it's nearly impossible to, you know, I feel like a lot of people listening just think they can just switch it on overnight and, hey, I'll just wait until the market you know, as rolls over, but that, that, that can happen pretty quickly. We actually had just a great podcast drop today. We're recording this November 4th um, with a short selling analytics company that walks through a lot of the uh, short selling um, stuff in, in depth, which listeners you may like. Um, but, but yeah, having it on, I think in, in, in anticipation of the turn uh, is kind of how you have to approach it. The, pro the problem with trying to switch it on and off and I, I, I you know, there are good reasons why using a moving average 
over the course of a full cycle does help you. It, that, that also delivers a more interesting return profile where it does truncate the very worst busts, but then it also has the same problem like any there is a cost to it and it gets whipsawed at, at various times and that's really the the greatest pain with trying to time the shorts is that at the time that you want to put the shorts on everybody else wants to put the shorts on too and so you're you know if you're doing it through options you've got all of the vol in those positions if you're doing it through shorts a lot of the move has often happened because the just the the nature of these beasts is that they tend to sell off a little bit earlier the market kind of sniffs it out like that's part of the that is part of the the sort of bust uh, dynamics that individual names start falling before the whole snowball really gets going. And often it's these things that just, it may even be that them that precipitate the whole fall. And I, we, I certainly saw that in the, in March this year that the sell-off started occurring in some of these high flying names. Unfortunately, it also happened in the value names. So the value names started suffering earlier than anything else too. I don't know what that leaves to sort of hold the rest of the market up, but the rest of the market did sort of drift sideways for about a month with everybody saying, where's the vol? You know, we know that this terrible uh, pandemic is coming our way and it's just not reflected in the stock market. Yeah. And of course it all happened very quickly. You have any particularly memorable um, trades over the past few years, either on the, the good side where it worked out or on the bad side where you got uh, taken to the woodshed, anything, uh, anything come to mind? You know, there have been, um, there have been very few on the good side. It's been uniformly <laughs> bad for, for so long. I've almost forgotten. That was one of the, one of the things that I used to love, like, you know, I ran Greenbacked, which is this little blog, uh, pulling up net nets. And one of the things I love about net nets, it's basically they do, they don't trade. They just sit there doing nothing for years and years and years. And then you wake up one day and they're up like 50 or a hundred or 200%. So one of those was, uh, there was this company that, um, they were looking for, they were a biotech and there was a, they had $2 in cash trading at about 70 cents. And uh, there was an activist trying to get them to give back the cash. And they had these, this drug candidate in with the FDA. And I had, the holding was at 70 cents. And I thought, this is a pretty good, this is a safe, like maybe you don't get $2 back, but maybe you get $1.50 back. Maybe this is a pretty safe hundred percent return. And I just, this is a long time ago, by the way, I'm not, yeah. this is not any of the funds that I manage. I just woke up one day and the stock was up 10 times. And then by the time I got to the office, so it was up at $7. By the time I got to the office, it was $11. And this was before you could trade on your phone. So by the time I got to the office, it had traded all the way up to $11 because the, uh, the FDA had approved their drug candidate. Just one of those things like the, the, the event that I thought was so unlikely was the thing that actually happened. And then, um, so it proves that you better, better being lucky than good, I guess. I mean, it, it, it takes me back. I mean, thinking about, you know, all the parallels, the late nineties. I mean, I, I used to very vividly recall professors trading stocks during class. Um, you had all of these IPOs that it was like shooting ducks in a barrel that when they hit their, um, uh, lockup expiration would just get hammered. And I feel like with a lot of stuff going on with SPACs now, but on the flip side, uh, you had in the aftermath, a lot of companies that would straight up trade below their cash levels, you know, and, okay. and buying a basket of those is an interesting way to think about, um, you know, getting potential free call options along the way, uh, like the, like the biotech. Um, we have a podcast that will be out by the time this is public with um, uh, a concept of doing SPAC arbitrage where you can be buying these SPACs that are trading below the issue price and guarantee a bond yield with get potential uh, deal consummation. Anyway, go listen to that, that one. Was, that was a classic kind of special situation strategy a little bit over 10 years ago when there were all of these from the last go round when everybody tried to raise a SPAC. There were a lot of these zombie SPACs facts that and that was the play was not try and buy this thing before it buys a business and has the huge pop like the ipo type pop the play then was buy these things in the months before they have to declare that they can't do an acquisition and then get back you know they might trade down it might be eight dollars 75 with it and you get the ten dollars back if the if it's not approved the beauty of the SPAC is it has a finality. Um, you know, we've talked many times on this podcast about like closed in funds trading at discounts. And the problem with those sort of ARBs 
is, you know, it's not guaranteed to ever close. Uh, you could, you know, we, we talked a lot this year, uh, listeners, you can go back to the Twitter and elsewhere. We talked about Bill Ackman's uh, um, uh, foreign listed hedge fund was trading at like a 50% or 40% discount to net asset value uh, back in, I think, March and has had a monster run. Um, but those you can never guarantee, right? Like there's no, there's no necessary catalyst on a lot of those that they have to close uh, the, the well, spread. My, my old boss, funnily enough, um, who just runs his own money now, but he, he's a fan of Bill Ackman's uh, from a distance and saw that that had traded down. That's exactly what he does. He looks for things that are trading at a big discount to NAV. And so flew to New York, met with them, decided that it was probably likely that they were going through a bad period and, it's Bill Ackman. There's a pretty good chance that they turn it around. They get some good performance. So managed to buy it at that big discount and put about 20% of his assets into it. And so it has had a blockbuster run out of that thing as a result of that, not knowing that there was going to be the big payoff, but just knowing that you could buy that at a discount to NAV that was sufficient to probably pay you. Well, I, I had a theory and I almost never, ever, ever tr talk about, you know, kind of positions or securities uh, publicly. It's more kind of macro level. Um, but was talking about it on Twitter because I said, there's actually two things I think the market didn't understand um, that, that were potential tailwinds. So you already had the discount, which is well known. And, and, but that happened in all the closed in funds. I said with particular, this one is he had placed some uh, hedging trades to where he had protected to the downside, the portfolio and had a massive payoff. I think he made a few billion on these hedging trades lifted them, also went on CNBC with a very terrible like performance and people were like just crushing him um, on CNBC. But I said, there's a non-trivial chance that um, there is a large discount based on people just not liking him, you know? And I said, this, that's not a rational you know, thing to be doing. And so um, I exited way too early, but that was, those type of trades are my favorite. Those just big fat discounts, but they also had, the third thing was they have a buyback program in place for the fund. So it's like always eating itself when it's trading in these net asset values. Anyway, I, I haven't looked it up. We'll have to add it to the show notes, but, uh, it's probably still trading at a, at a discount, but he's, he's having a monster year. Third point also has one similar kind of story. They've they've executed a little buyback in that. So that's a, that's a UK listed. Yeah, uh, the, get the ticker. The the only problem with these, we actually wrote about that one during the last financial crisis. Third point got to I think a fifty percent discount to NAV. Um, I think the challenge with U.S. investors is that you can only hold them essentially uh, short term, or you have to. Uh, like disclose them on your taxes because they're passive foreign investment companies. So I think I you have to you have to mark to market it each year. It gets a little wonky, but you can often not hold them for a whole year and just call it short term capital gains. Anyway, just, <laughs> do your due diligence, listeners. Um, but yes, the same thing happens is you can kind of um, get those often at, at a massive and theoretically just hedge them with the opposite side if you wanted to because you can see they're holding. Toby, we could go on for hours. We probably should, but uh, what else? Anything on your brain as we start to wind down uh, 2020? Still a month ago by the time this comes out, I imagine. Uh, any general thoughts on the horizon, what you're looking forward to? You can ever launch a foreign fund? Anything else on your, on your brain? Yeah, I, I think that the, the other thing that I would like to do is, is uh, probably a strategy hedge to what I do. So I'd probably... You know, I'm I'm never going to do a momentum type fund, but I I do like the uh, the more of the Buffett style investment. I know that for people who aren't necessarily steeped in value, uh, it would be funny to say that the the kind of the the Buffett stuff is is not what I you know value looks. I, I know value looks sort of monolithic from the from the outside, but that that there there are particular behaviors of some of the companies that. So rather than beginning on a value basis, you begin at a sort of, um, you know, look at the defensibility of the business and the, it's more of a, an analysis of how, how, how the business sort of performs over the full cycle. So it's been a very difficult period for traditional value guys, deep value guys. But I think that if you have a little bit more exposure to sort of growth and 
um, probably better businesses that you, you could have done a little bit better through this period. So I think that I'd like to, I'm working now on a book that sort of describes that strategy and then that will, that will, I don't know how long that's going to take. They seem to, books always take two or three times as long as I think they're going to write. So I, I, at some stage that'll come out. I just hope that before it comes out, there's a little tailwind to value, to traditional but, but, value. Uh, but focus on public markets, correct? Investing on the public markets. Yeah, it might not be a public market fund though. So here's my idea for you. And I just, I thought about it as you're talking about this is that, all right, you got the, the Zig, which focuses on large cap. You got deep, so like deep, deeper. And then this value, deepest. Can, we have deepest. And I, and I pulled up, this is an article I wrote back in March, 2009. Um, Good timing. See if, you, see if you can get the reference, but it was there was a quote where it says in 1939, with Hitler's Germany ravaging Europe, John Templeton bought hundred dollars of every stock trading below one dollar on the New York Stock and American Stock Exchange. Got him a junk pile of 104 companies, 34 of which went bankrupt. For a total investment of 10 grand, four years later he sold it for more than 40,000. So we'll do deepest, but it's going to get the truly like sub 75. No, probably have to do it as a private fund. I don't think we could get away with this in a uh, uh, you, value you capitulation can't. fund. <laughs> yeah, I, th I feel like I've already got value capitulation well uh, and truly covered in the existing uh, stuff. I think that I, what I'd like to see is a little value renaissance. A little value tailwind would be kind of incredible because it's been, it's been a long time tacking into the wind for value. So that'd be great. And then I think that eventually, you know, a more uh, Buffett style fund would probably be where I'll go. Well, I tell you on the... Um the, the area that I think is fascinating on the growth side, which we've been talking a lot about, is, is, is been on the private side with this sort of sub 50 million because of this QSBS tax hack, which gives you massive, um, I think it's one of the most impactful pieces of legislation for investors and startups in arguably decades. But listeners, this is for another podcast, but it basically gives you essentially um, no taxable gains on, on investments you make in private companies that are small. Uh, but being able to put together a basket of those and avoid taxes, man, what a, I mean, assuming, assuming you have any return, but <laughs> you can even match S and P in that. That's, that's a unbelievable. Um, what's the, what's this definition of small? So it's, it's 50 million in, they call it, um, there's some like accounting uh, metric, which means it could actually be, it's not 50 million market cap, it's like 50 million in assets or something. But basically any startup sub series A or series B. Um, and then the tax benefit is you get 10 times or $10 million. And I could be getting this wrong, but this is directionally correct. 10 times your investment or $10 million, whichever is greater tax-free. So, I mean, that's unbelievable. Like if you hit a, a home run on one of these, um, you have no taxes. And uh, anyway, again, it's for another, this is for another podcast, but I mentioned it on Twitter the other day. I said, I think this is the most impactful piece of, uh, you know, legislation, tax hack, whatever. How many of you heard of this? And it's like 90% have never heard of it. And so um, yeah, anyway. I thought you were talking about the Jobs Act or some version of the Jobs Act. No, it came out. It came out during the Obama. I think it was in the Jobs Act. It's, it's part of that. Okay. Qualified small business stock. Um, you guys can Google it. QSBS. We talked about it on the Ru Ruble Kava podcast years ago. Um, but uh, but anyway, you can also now put private companies in your IRAs and elsewhere. But uh, but investors certainly look into it. I think it's a pretty pretty interesting hack on the, on the private side, but you got ETFs. So those, those usually defer the taxes too. Um, Toby, this has been fun. Where do people find you? Where do they go? Yeah. Thanks for having me, Meb. I'm, I'm on Twitter at Greenback. It's a funny spelling G R E E N B A C K D or you can search my name. I have a website acquirersmultiple.com, and that has a free screener for the, for the uh, acquirers multiple stocks plus links to all of the books that I've written, including The Acquirer's Multiple, which I pitched on your show in 2017. So thank you for having me on for that one. And uh, acquirersfunds.com, where you can learn about Zig and Deep and uh, anything else that we do. 
listeners, if you send Toby an email or a letter, he, he'll promise to send you a hand signed copy with a photo of himself at the telescope <laughs> of uh, acquires uh, multiple. Um, when you why you know why why we mothballed Greenback? That is up there with uh, Damodaran's. It's like a it's like an old school blog blog post uh, blogger uh, design. Shame on you, Toby. Yeah, it's a great. It's, I, I tried to resurrect it. I, I I was putting some I was putting some podcasts up on there for a little while, but uh, we were going to do a deal with um, the street, the the owners of the street, and uh, I think it's called Maven or something like that. But it, uh, it didn't eventuate. They wanted they wanted editorial control in a podcast. Who knows what's going to happen? Good lord, uh, I got I got fired from the street many years ago, which is hard <laughs> to do if you don't get paid. I'll tell you that story later. Uh, Toby, thanks so much. Uh, promise to have you back on when value makes the turn. So yeah, that'd be great in the future, in a decade yeah. or so. Well, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll probably already happen. Uh, let's not jinx it. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt.